Hey everyone, this is the Trade to Black podcast. I am your host, Shad Dales. Joining me as usual is the lead financial writer, Benjamin A. Smith. Ben, how's it going? It's going well. Along with the manager and co-founder of the Polaris Equity Group, Rob Seacrest. Rob, how are things? Well, it's a beautiful place to uh, do our little podcast. I know. Here. We love these on-location podcasts. So people are wondering, what the hell are we doing? Standing on the edge of a cliff, 3,000 feet up, but we are in the middle of Desert Springs, California. Last week, you announced uh, a debt financing uh, lending to Terrison for $45 million. Uh, created a lot of attention within the actual industry itself, but we want to scale it back. And the reason why we're here, just to show some of our viewers, is where this all began for your firm. So when you look at this community, touch on maybe a little bit as to where this community was five, six years ago. Uh, the big difference this whole cannabis industry has uh, made for this community and obviously the uh, the impact that you've provided pertaining to it. Yeah, so um, Desert Hot Springs was the first city to uh, be uh, to go cannabis friendly for recreational in 2016 and we were this is where we started our lending we we uh, built the uh, now Harborside Dispensary was our first transaction which we visited today. Yep. And um, you know that city was going bankrupt and they figured they had nothing to lose. Um, so they might as well try to save the city. And uh, today that city is being regentrified with uh, a new economic boom that has been coming in since 2016. And after you've seen many of the facilities there and, and not only ours, but everything else that's been built there, the jobs created, that brings in lifeblood and brings in more housing, brings in more ancillary business, brings in the, the, the contractors for building the facilities, for servicing the air conditionings, uh, all, all the different ancillary services that people need to realize comes here as well. So we're happy to have helped uh, yeah. bring some leverage uh, to so that d people didn't have to do that all out of equity. And that's our strategy was to take uh, owners of these properties and, and cannabis operators and try to provide some some financing so that they were able to maximize their equity and right. a little bit further down the down the, the path than just out of pure equity alone. Why was this market your first choice? Well, this was the first city that went uh, cannabis uh, friendly in after the uh, state went recreational. So this 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 was the area. So this tra the transaction that we did first here was a free and clear transaction. You, you you really can't have a whole lot of risk when there's it's own free and clear. Right. Our entire loan was a budget. So we are dispersing funds only after the borrower has advanced the money themselves and we're reimbursing them after doing inspection. So every time that dollars have been put out by the borrower, they're adding value to the property. So there was already a $600,000 cost basis. There. Wow. And then we're doling out our funds on top of that. So we're always going to be in a protected position is if we can provide an alternative to people from opiates. That's the biggest right. thing for me personally. I have a, a, yeah. a personal reason that, that that's important is that if we could have people start on cannabis products as opposed to starting on an opiate-based pain reliever, I think that's the holy grail. It's incredible. I just, you know, when I think about all the people that we've met this week, you know, being down here, I guess the biggest attitude from what I see is everybody's just bought into the overall success of the community. And when you're making announcements like last week about lending, obviously Terrison $45 million to obviously roll out their expansion of their business model. And I'm sure you're trying to build that footprint across the US, which you're already doing. Um, what's it mean to you to look back and like the difference that you've made where it all began within uh, this area? To put it into perspective, we've lent on over more than 4 million square feet across the country. We are not a multi-billion dollar market cap. Yeah. The largest company in the entire sector is IIPR. Yeah. They've done 8 million square feet. So we've done half of what they've done already. Wow. So very quickly we'll eclipse them. Right. And that is to just show where we're headed. They can't continue and sustain that model of what they're doing, but we can. So people are not going to continue to sell their assets and, and have a 15 year escalating lease into a market that that is going to get better cost on their debts and better better economies of scale over time as, as regulations and things uh, be, become be defrictioned and, and become more more cost effective solution. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that those we will quickly pass them. We took the slow and less risky path. We believe that having the equity protection that the borrower was putting there in front of us, 40 percent on our on our bridge lending product, 25 percent are fully stabilized personal and corporate guarantees for them from strong sponsors and experienced operators. 
we believe that that's a much stronger sustainable business model in an emerging market as opposed to using an equity REIT where you've cashed out the bar 100% day one and you would be the first loss, dollar loss leader if you had to take a loss. We don't have that, we have that equity protection. So bottom line, do you think what has been created in Desert Hot Springs can be replicated to other communities? I know it's a case by case basis and you look at it that way, but can this be replicated on the East Coast? Well, um, if you look at all the communities, any cannabis excise tax that comes to that community is a, is a, is a, is a new source of revenue. So that's just one sliver of the revenue. You have all the jobs, you have the payroll tax, you have the building, you have all the other uh, revenues that are coming from, that are ancillary to that business. So any, any cannabis use case for any city is going to generally be a positive thing. I think that the only negative ones that we've ever heard from it is that cannabis is a, is a I believe, a beautifully smelling plant, but some yeah. people disagree with me. Yeah. And that, that that smell can can transfer, and it may not be so great if you're next to a, a you know downwind of a church or something like that. Um, so, but there's ways to uh, mitigate that. And, and t these days, most of the facilities we were at today, you didn't notice it as much because they're mitigating it so much more than in the beginning. It was ten times what we smelled today when yeah. we first came here in each of these facilities. But I think the evolution though is going to be terpenes because terpenes is really gives you the entourage effect. Terpenes are the flavor of the cloud. Mm -hmm. So the higher the terpene content, uh, I mean, you could, as an example, you could you could smoke something that has a lower TAC, maybe the TAC is maybe a 10 or 22 versus a 30. And you can have a more enjoyable experience from the lower TAC because the terpene profile Interesting. is really That's fresh. It's got, it's, got, it's, got, it's got those can, those cannabinoids and the terpenes that make your body, just like a good flavor yeah. from food, you know, oh, you, you, you eat with your nose as much and, you're, and the taste as much as anything else. I'm more of a hybrid type person. I don't like, which means, you know, it's just in between, in like in between an indica <laughs> and in between a uh, sativa. So kind of in between, like a hybrid plant that isn't at the extreme of an indica, and isn't so extreme because like a sativa my experience has been with sativa that it might keep you awake it's like having mm -hmm. coffee at night it's like mm -hmm. it's like whoa you're, you know mm -hmm. but i'm sort of middle of the road where I'm, I'm relaxed but my head's clear i can have a conversation with my mom and not feel stupid you know that that that's the kind of high that i prefer yeah and that you know i find myself doing stuff around the house and chores and i can be creative and do things if i if i smoke a good hybrid Right now, maybe a few more give or take. Each plant has a metric tag and a strain tag. So the colorful tag here will let you know the strain here. This one here is Tres Leche. Um, as you can see, there's many different strains throughout the room right. here. We always make sure we have three to five moms of any current cultivar, just to make sure we have what we need to take our cut should we choose to take something different on right. the fly. 90% of what you do needs to be done right here. The other part is academic and maybe 10% of the effort. It's going to be a lot of effort, but this is where it happens. This has got, you got to have healthy moms. They don't want to be more than four months old. Uh, you want to be taking cuts on them much past four months. You maybe get two or three cuts on a mom. You want them young and healthy, but as, as goes your mom and veg, goes the entire garden. You can't fix it after this. If it's wrong coming out of here, it can't be fixed in flower. So as you guys saw on our cloning racks, that was the last stop before we come into here. This room holds about three of our flower rooms worth of plants at any given point. Um, once we come in here, we spend about 25 days in here. We do several toppings on everything and this should be about what they look at like before we load out. So to Tony's point, we'll be harvesting F1 in the morning. After two days of cleanup, these gals will be ready to go in and start flowering. And what is a topping for people who don't know what that is? A uh, topping would be removing part of the meristem to stimulate other node development. So basically to make more arms on the plants. So instead of seeing like a nice little Christmas tree going straight up, right. you see maybe three, maybe four, maybe six arms, depending on the strain and how many times you top. So at one point we did have a 16,000 gallon agriculture tank in here. It did. Which by the way, had to be pot in here to put inside because they should have built the building around it. So that was part of the problem. That'd be assembled in the building, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, it was not really meant for indoor use or for our purposes. We did eventually replace it because it was very hard to maintain and upkeep, which to your point was very difficult to get out. We had to take it apart in here and pull it out piece by piece. But we have replaced our RO tanks with uh, sealed up tanks. So we got no light penetration in there. It's much easier to use, much more efficient for us is because you grow slime and mold in your RO tanks. So our large tank was essentially a giant scum pond when we removed it. And that was not something we wanted to deal with. That must have been such a hard decision to make. But after, I mean, every time we'd come here, it was like a critical piece. And to, to de-risk that in, in, is, you guys are now, we've, we've had this facility for four years. Four years. Um, that was, when we financed this in the beginning, it probably took a year to build, but you know, it takes time to realize, is it cost benefit to replace that, that tank? And obviously it finally will work. If you ask me, Tony, where do you need work? I, I'll be the first one to tell you operations can do better. Yeah. And we're always striving to do better. But it's sales and market penetration is what we need. We yeah. need to get share, we need to get shares of sales and yeah. we get You could increase your forty percent to higher if you had the demand for yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, we got we got enough growth potential in actual flour that we grow yeah. to grow our brand for the next yeah. couple of years. Yeah. And that's really what we want to do. I would rather sell it in a jar than in bulk. And how do you think about players that are coming in with large indoor indoor grows that can reduce their costs lower? by dollar cost averaging. How do you feel about that? Do you feel threatened by that? Do you think that that's an issue? Do you think that you've got a lane for you that's gonna work regardless of what somebody does for economies of scale that they've, that they've been? Okay, so what we talked about earlier in the conversation was the, the companies that are gonna survive are the ones that can deliver the best quality. Uh, price is also a big part of that, but it's the best quality. So I would say uh, a large grow, uh, bigger than this with, with, again, we talked about room size. When you get much above a, 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 a room that's much above 2,000 square feet, there's-, there's It's hard to pro control the macro environment. Yeah, and that the, other, and the other, other, so, so, no, I'm not threatened by them because I feel like as long as our quality is on point, our diversity is good, yeah. um, that's what we're gonna win. The, the other thing too is we've switched our model and most of the rooms that you're in, only have one cultivar, and that's by design. Because when you're only growing, when you grow one cultivar in a in a in a flower room, you can totally manipulate your your nu nutrients specific to that the one. amount of water that because sativas drink different than indicas, and hybrids drink different than both of them. So, mm -hmm. and 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 even within a family, a different cultivar might drink and eat differently. Yeah. So being able to grow them in independent rooms like that, so you get these big grows. They may get great costs, but they might have to put 15 different cultivars in a big room and, and they can't tailor their grow usually. And to, throw away bigger portions when it doesn't work out. But they can't optimize each cultivar. Yeah. We're here in Desert Hot Springs. This is the Morongo Business Park. What's unique about this business park is that the owners of this park built this land on spec. Okay. Prior to the legislation in California going recreational. Okay and it was prognosticated that desert hot springs would be the first city to go uh, cannabis friendly and there was a voter referendum going and so they had not it had not passed yet the owners of this pro property brought this dirt prior to knowing anything but they knew that this was going to most likely be the green zone and they bought the dirt on spec and then lo and behold the the, the prop passed and this was the green zone and so they had a, an unbelievable land basis. I think it was several hundred thousand dollars. Wow. I, I don't remember what it was, but like three to six hundred, something like that. Um, but it was just dirt. It would be not even worth that if, if it, that didn't happen. But they're real estate developers. And many people that got into the industry were, were, pre, were former real estate developers, but just couldn't find profitable projects anymore because the sales prices were 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 not as high as they needed to be and the costs were too high. So the profit margin was too thin to really do anything. And so they started looking for alternatives, what they could do with their skill set, similar to what we did with our lending skill set. Okay. And so this facility, what they did is they took their mentality of development to here and they realized, why would we just do one standalone transaction and, and all the infrastructure costs, the power, the water supply, the security, 
All of these things are required for any one building to get a conditional use permit for cannabis use. So in California, there's two types of licenses that are required for each transit for each property. The conditional use permit, which allows that property to be designated cannabis use, which must be in a green zone as well. And then the cannabis use tenant has to be licensed by the cannabis by the state as well, but it has to be tied to a specific cannabis use property that's been approved. Gotcha. So that there's two elements to it. The conditional use permit transfers with the value of the property. So once it's put in place, it always stays in place that valuation. So let, let's fast forward to where we are today. We look at all these area, these facilities. You financed a, a lot of this project itself and a lot of these facilities are sold, correct? Yeah. So where I was going on this particular project is that to do a, a, a cannabis project, the, the expenses that are necessary for the improvements, the power, the water, the security, this all has to be a gated system. You'll see when we walk around here that it's all a security gate, there's a guard house. Right. If you can amortize that, dollar cost average that over you know, dozens and dozens of facilities, it reduces your cost. Right. Where if you're an individual spec builder and you're trying to do it on a one-off, you're never gonna make it with a guy like this. So these guys spent millions of dollars just putting in the infrastructure. In this particular facility, the infrastructure is, is power is a major issue out here. These guys, uh, SDG and E or whoever it is, uh, there's, their power line has an easement over this property. Mm -hmm. So they got a special condition for the power. They have enough power to supply any of this and more phases if necessary. Not everybody has that. The last facility we're at, Candescent, they were told you they had 2200, 2200 amps max. These guys have almost indefinite max. They, they can get whatever they need here. So that's a special issue out here. In addition to that, all the cannabis products have runoff and it has to be dealt with in a certain way for the for the rain off the, the rainwater and any water that's leaving the facility. So there's a treatment water for this entire place is all done in one spot. And so all of these costs are aggregated. So water is not an issue. Water's not an issue, but the runoff is, a, is the how you deal with the runoff is an important issue for cannabis use properties. And so this particular facility, they also went one step further. If they could make this whole entire business development a condo, a condo complex, mm -hmm. like condominiums, you theoretically could have the entire thing mapped with conditional use permits for all of them at once. So now you don't have to apply for a conditional use permit for each one. It's already in place. Gotcha. So, so this wasn't zoned commercial? This yes, what didn't even exist. So it, the, the, in the conditional use permit and the entitlement, it would be industrial use. Gotcha. So the advantage here was they were the first movers of this size and scale, and they all had conditional use permits already ready to go. Okay. And so as these, a funny trick here is some of the units were sold before the, some of the buildings were sold on spec before the building had even been started, and you can't get the, the, the conditional use permit until it's completed. So what they did is they put containers on here, literally stripping containers and called that the building to get the conditional use permit. Wow. The so that by the time it was built, that it was already, that they had the conditional use. Permit. So you, you, you've labeled this as the green zone. We've had some conversations as to how this whole area has been revamped in Desert Springs. Where are we today? And where do you see, like you're talking about all these facilities that are sold, opportunities it presents for you, but most importantly for the community itself. Yeah. So, um, you know, Desert Hot Springs, this whole valley out here, Coachella Valley, um, Palm Springs, Cathedral yeah. City, they're all taking advantage of, of the, they, they issue a lower tax rate out here okay. to incentivize businesses to build out here. And, and Desert Hot Springs was going bankrupt. That's why they were the first ones to go cannabis friendly for recreational. So, you know, this, this tax referendum that passed here for Desert Hot Springs saved the city. Um, the last bar we were at at one time, they, they may or may not still be today, was the largest private employer of the entire city. And so this has saved the, the city and now is driving the economy here and is building back the infrastructure. And once you start having infrastructure, you have jobs, then you have housing and the rest follows. So in another five years, when you come back here, 
There'll be housing, multifamily probably being built here. Wow. That would have never been contemplated yeah. before because you have to house the workforce. Wow. It's not, it's not an exaggeration to say that cannabis is saving communities in oh, yeah. California and it, throughout the U.S. 40% of the town's revenue is from cannabis. That's 40%. We, we get the question from our institutional investors, what type of ESG you know, metrics do you have? Well, we don't have any. There's nobody collecting it. But, I mean, we saved the freaking town. What is that worth? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So... You know, and but anyway, this particular project, the fact that they were there was, I think, 17 buildings originally. We knew all 17 were built, were, were pre-sold because every single loan came to us. So we already had that data and metrics and we were seeing those prices. We were seeing that demand to make us feel comfortable when we issued. We've done uh, several loans in here. And so the facility behind us here is one of our, our projects called Grow Packers. And this is the largest bottling capacity. Um, they do hot and cold uh, infused cannabis infused beverages and also for uh, uh, hot and cold beverages as well. And they also do packaging. And so this facility, their idea, and it's a brilliant idea, they're a distributor, but they realize distributing is just a relations, it's a commodity, it's just a service. But if you can add on packaging and co-packing, all of a sudden as a distributor, you become very sticky because it's very difficult to move your co-packing and all of those other services. So they're distributing. Why, how, explain, explain what that means. Well, distributing is technically just moving the product from one part of the state to the other. Correct. So that is a commodity. It's purely service, yeah. you know, consistent and lowest price. But if you add on ancillary services to your distributor that you also can do their co-packing, you're already, you're already shipping the product, but if I can co-pack and make your gummies for you, if I can make your right. THC infused beverages for you, if I can do, if I can weigh and, and package and, and label all your stuff, all of a sudden you can free up space in your facility and, uh, and put more canopy and shift all that stuff over to here. We're here with the Dales Report and I'm uh, speaking a little bit on behalf of Shad just because I've been to the facility before. I'm Rob Seacrest with Polaris Equity Group and I'm here with Gino from Grow Packers. We're gonna talk about this, this facility, which is a co-packing facility. It's one of my favorite uh, transactions we've ever done in the half a billion dollars that we've issued, 72 transactions, and it still remains one of our favorites today. And he's gonna show you some of the amazing things that we have going on here. Why we're the favorite. <laughs> yeah, all right, let's go. How Tonic's doing? Yeah. Tonic's doing great. So, um, top, top seven beverage in the state. I think we just came in at number six. Okay. Um, and how many awards did you guys win? Uh, the ones that we enter. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, we've, we've taken down every everything that we've entered. And, and that would that have anything to do with your partnership with who flavors your drinks? Yeah. So kind of unique thing when we first started this entire company, you know, the the general idea was to become like the Pepsi Cola of the industry. We knew there was going to be the flower, which is kind of like the Frito and Doritos, right? So from a distribution standpoint, that's kind of how we saw ourselves, and we wanted to have the manufacturing prowess for those products as well. Okay. So when you have the uh, when you build an entire building around you know beverage manufacturing, which you guys will see in a minute, you got to have brands to do it with. And so as we started this journey, uh, the brand you know we had Simrise, which is you know the second largest flavoring house in the world, was someone that kind of came behind us and said, hey, we want to get behind you guys and help you with any product formulation or any you know flavoring or anything along those lines. And, so, and what are some of the brands that Simrise has done stuff for that uh, you can share? Simrise is claimed to fame. They're the only company that works with both Coca-Cola and Pepsi. Wow. Okay. So um, wow. they're, you know, Sour Patch Kids, Scope, Listerine, like all that kind of stuff that you've had, mm -hmm. it's likely created by Simrise. How much advancement have you seen in the cannabis beverage landscape over the last couple of years? Uh, I mean, over the last couple of years, it's been it's been tremendous, right? So it kind of came in and everybody wasn't sure where beverage was going to land in the beginning. Um, we built for scale. Uh, so we're designed by the ability to manufacture for the entire West Coast. Uh, but when you came in originally, people were like, you know, I, where's your flower? Right. Mm -hmm. like, we want to see we want to see the flower. And uh, just actually in 2022, you've seen the demand for beverages skyrocket. Wow. So um, innovation is kind of a big deal. Uh, understanding the consumption methods versus edibles. You know, edibles are about 20 to 30 percent of the market, um, but they form, you know, usually gummies, chocolates, things along those lines. With with beverage, it's a completely different, different, you know, feeling. It's got a different effect. It's got a different absorption. Um, so it hits you more quickly. The onset's mm -hmm. better. And where I'm starting to see it really take off is actually with medical patients. Really. So you're starting to see your, um, you're starting to see. You know, people that didn't even know beverage existed, and now that's infused with cannabis, it's it's complicated, right? Because you're going from an oil to a beverage, and it's got to be 
homogenized throughout the entire can. So your first sip should be as potent as your last sip. And that's where the magic happens. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's kind of where we've, we've built from there. Um, so consumers interested in this industry, you talked about flour, how it's pivoting to beverage. If you could share information to people that want to see how this industry matures from, say, the beverage standpoint, right? What are you forecasting in the next, you know, say, three to five years pertaining to the industry? Uh, from a capacity standpoint and what the consumption uh, you're going to see, and, and from a macro market, I think. Yeah, yeah. From a macro market, I mean, right now, beverage sales represent, you know, less than five percent of the entire market. Uh, over the course of the next, you know, two to three years, it's expected to increase to be 25 to 30 percent of the market. Mm -hmm. um, if they can get that high? I, I actually yeah. think it could go much higher. Yeah. Wow. Uh, I, yeah so. I, I think in 10 to 20 years, that'll be the highest by far. And to go back to the, the, the demand side of it, it, it kind of goes back to like where I started, right? I, when, I first, when I first started with Grow Packer, I just wasn't a consumer. And it's as simple, simple as that. And, you know, being a being a father, being responsible, like I wasn't yeah. gonna start, you know, consuming cannabis. It wasn't at least I didn't think so. And uh, then I learned about beverages. And then, you know, then you have, you know, it's just like having a couple beers at night or having a bourbon or something. You like, oh, I'm gonna take the edge off at the end of the night or during the weekend or whatever yeah. it is. Uh, when you go to most social events or if we were to go out to lunch right now and have a beer, we would just sit down and have a beer. We're starting to see that happening with cannabis. People really? that wouldn't pr wouldn't primarily consume are able to have but what cannabis or what beverage has done is is allowed for what's what's known as microdosing, and so microdosing is just simply you know if I was to, if I was to pass a blunt around to each of us right now we're gonna take a rip off of that you can't control how high you're about to get because of the drag that you take right you don't know how many you know milligrams which would you know be the the equivalent uh, on the beverage side, but now with beverage I can make you a 12 ounce can put it on ice and you know give that to you and say it's 10 milligrams that has been a big part to make it so that this form factor of a beverage can can create community between people that are utilizing different uh types of, of drugs alcohol as opposed to thc if you both have the same beverage you want to be able to not be having to think about one drinking alcohol and one drinking right. thc you should just be able to sit down and be at a, basically the same level and that's 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 the secret to, to expanding the market. If you can get that that community to happen, that's when it'll explode. Actually, the city of Indio just finally approved cannabis um, consumption. So wow. we, do believe, we nice. do believe that cannabis consumption in Coachella will happen uh, in 2023. Awesome. What's the average demographic that goes to Coachella? Bro, I'm, not me, but I, everybody, everybody else here. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's, yeah. That's my point. It's it's 18 that, to 45. Look, I hope we all have bright futures. When we think of the future, look at university stats, the amount of consumption of alcohol has gone down drastically. Right. So to your point, Rob, that you said earlier, it's like, what does the future hold and what's normal to them, yeah. right? So if you've got, and, you and know. I, I'm, so I'll take you a step further, right? So when you have, when you have a beverage, right? And you're, you're just even interested, right? So like, if I was to give you a beer right now, you know what your tolerance is, right? It's just like hitting a nine iron. How far do you hit a nine iron? Yeah, right. right? You good, figure good that out, right? Mm -hmm. If you, if I gave you a shot of tequila, right, you yeah. would know what that shot of tequila is. Yeah. If I could lined up three shots of tequila, you would definitely know where you're going with yeah. it. So with, with cannabis, you you know, you could sit here and have a bunch of joints that you're about to smoke, or you can take a dab, or your, you know, whatever whatever it is that your method is, or if you have a gummy, right? The thing about gummies is you take that gummy and it's ten milligrams, but it doesn't hit you for like an hour. Yeah. Right? And so maybe you have another gummy because you're like, well, that was one gummy bear. Yeah. Right? I'm gonna take a second gummy yeah. bear because they're delicious. And now I'm out of my and mind. Now now you're really in trouble, <laughs> right? Because you just took twenty milligrams. With the with the drink it's completely different. You have, you know, beverages in as small as a one ounce all the way to a with that faster beverage. onset. Yeah. And that faster onset allows you to know, oh, I just drank something. Oh, I can feel this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's yeah. getting absorbed in your That's bloodstream as soon as it hits your mouth versus going through your digestive system. So a lot of edibles, like just the onset takes a lot longer than say beverages. And, sure. yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's why that form factor is going to be the one that rules this in, I mean, we're looking 10 years out. And, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. and socially too, you got to remember that it's, it's common to have a drink, right? You're, you're used to having a drink. Hey, welcome to my house. Can I get you something to drink? you know and this here's what i have right? the important and, thing though and i was this conversation earlier it's just the growth of the industry and what you're learning along the way oh my god like when we start talking about this industry from a business standpoint you go back to 2014 2015 right that feels like 30 years ago pertaining to this industry doesn't so, it cannabis is dog years 
It's yeah. real simple. And, and <laughs> yeah. If you don't use that one, use it because yeah. cannabis, every single quarter is a year, mm. which I know dog years is seven, but every yeah. every single year is technically if you're in it, if you're in cannabis for a year, it's like you just went through four. Uh -huh. Every single quarter is yeah. a year. Yeah. Yeah. And and you learn so much, and there's so much that happens, and the market evolves so much yeah. during that time. Um, and you know, last last kind of touch on on cannabis from a microdosing standpoint is I think it's important to to just remember that. Remember that you know cannabis now comes in as small as five milligrams, sometimes even smaller than that. Um, so that's, you know, there's people already making plays that you're going to take, drink two or three of these yeah. just to feel the, the effect of what you're looking mm -hmm. for. Um, the industry started with the hundred milligrams. Which I like that because I drink non-alcoholic beers and I like the taste of the beer, yeah. but I don't necessarily want to get high. Right. And I would, I would do that. That would be a good beverage for me. Right. And, and then, so now you start introducing new cannabinoids, right? So you talk about, ah, you talk about dog cool. years and you talk about how big, how long the industry has been here, but how much it's evolved. Well now introduce new cannabinoids, right? So it all started with THC distillate, which is Delta nine. That's going to get you high. But now what, you know, there's THCV, THCP, THCO, yeah. right? There's THCA, like all of these in a decarboxylated form are going to give you a different effect. Right. So now you have to activate those and, you know, start having the effects. So what's going to end up happening is, you know, you're going to just start seeing, you know, in my opinion, you're going to start seeing these different cannabinoids being mixed with known uh, active ingredients like alcohol, mm -hmm. um, you know, Ooh. and I want to be you know, personally THCV tequila. One of the uh, biggest <laughs> tailored effects, in other words, <laughs> which alcohol doesn't do. It's just you're, you're getting hit with your vodka, you're, you're just getting hit with the same effect. That yeah. is it's great. Just, that is a that is a great way to say it. It is yeah, tailored yeah. effects in cannabis can be done and you can do it through through inhalables. Yeah. You absolutely. Can, they're already doing inhalables. Yeah. Our whole piece is to take inhalables and put them into beverage, uh -huh. which is is literally not happening. We're, we are the first people. To when you're designing a beverage manufacturing for cannabis, you know, the thing about cannabis, there's the element of, of the effect, right? And, and the, the result is you're going to get, you know, you're going to get high. There's going to be that relief and pain. But the big thing for us was to make sure that it was, you're still looking at wellness, okay. right? And so this entire uh, manufacturing facility for beverage specifically was designed to be done without any type of um, preservatives, okay? So preservatives were a thing like, hey, let's do this to where you don't have, have any preservatives. Um, so that's gonna come down to pasteurization. So, you know, we have the ability to, you know, heat things up to 160 degrees in the tank, flash crash right here, and then you're gonna send it to your bright tanks. And flash crash, just so you know, is to ch transfer that heat to cold instantly. Exactly, instantly gotcha. to heat. So you're able to pasteurize by heat, and then you're able to crash it before you go into a cold tank to prepare for carbonation. Gotcha. So you have to be able to get that temperature down before you can start doing any type of pumping. Right. right. And uh, that's that's that hundreds and hundreds of thousands of equipment on the other outside of the building is to make that happen through here. Exactly. So you have chillers and heat, you know, heat exchangers, um, you know, for CO2 and everything else that, that goes on with it outside. Uh, but yeah, that was important. That was important for us uh, by design. And what's funny is, is, you know, people have sacrificed pretty quickly, not, not any of the brands that we work with, but you started seeing like, well, we just put preservatives in it. And it's because nobody had the manufacturing built. They, when they created their product, they thought they had to do the preservatives. So uh, when people come to us from a manufacturing standpoint, they're usually pretty excited. They're like, oh wow, you have, you have batch pasteurization or inline pasteurization, or you have the ability to um, you know, pasteurize the whole thing inside this tank. So gotcha. Pretty, pretty exciting for us. Um, and yeah. Is, is, it, is, it, is it true that this facility was uh, put together by somebody that had personally gotten an FDA certification? Yeah, so, you know, without federal guidance from, uh, from the United States, you know, that you can't go and now get your, your entire, you know, cannabis facility uh, to become, you know, FDA certified. Okay. So, um, CEO, founder, decided to get F FDA certified himself, became wow. a certified inspector. Uh, and they went ahead and built this two spec. Yeah, and, and if you just stand to the side, this is one of the issues, uh, one of the things that are required for an FDA certified facility is the time-lapse monitoring of that is shows the history of what's happening in this facility. It's a record data that, 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 can't, that can be looked at by an inspector. Um, in addition to manufacturing and distribution, we got a home delivery license, um, which was exciting for us, right? And so having a home delivery just makes sense. And the reason is, is when you have distribution partners and brands, you have their products sitting on consignment, ready to go B2B, right? And so being able to transition those products to go B2C is very, it's not capital intensive. Mm -hmm. So as, as most, you know, retailers only have to buy all their products, well, we have a large amount of our products that are on our menu sitting on, on consignment until the time of sale. Are you seeing change of habit with consumers, especially during COVID to now? about how instead of going into actual facilities, dispensaries, whatever, to consume the product, 
that it's all being home delivered? Uh, there's definitely a, a large um, amount of increase that we've seen on the delivery side, and I think it's just a statewide yeah. you know, metric. You're seeing an increase in delivery. I don't I know the and, percentage. And you just that. came online within the last six months? 12 months, months? actually. Two months, yeah. yeah. So they wouldn't have enough data points yeah. to have that. But I, but I can tell you just from behaviors that we see, you know, almost right. every brick and mortar now offers delivery. Um, they had to. They did delivery and pickup um, on the brick and mortar side, and then there's still opportunity for delivery um, for just for a lot of people that you know don't want to go to it. So how does that work then? Like consumer goes in brick and mortar for the first time. Once they understand what they're seeing and getting, would you say they then flip to a home delivery model? Or absolutely. I mean, there's there's differences there, right? Some your consumer that's willing to see a lot of uh, home deliveries have a minimum. Yeah. You know? So if you wanted yeah. to just go in and buy a pre roll, you could go to stop by a store buy a $10 pre-roll and leave. Um, but if you did want a home delivery, usually you're gonna see somewhere a 30 to $50 minimum on the order. Mm -hmm. So likely gonna be a little bit higher basket wow, okay. to make the delivery make sense because delivery is obviously very expensive yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. to just operate. Um, but, but to your point, yeah, since, since COVID and since you know, any type of changes in, in the overall you know, consensus of how people consume and how they, how they buy their products, um, delivery is, is definitely, you know, especially if you already, you know, I, I had a joint and you ran out and need more. <laughs> I just love I just love that you added a a a, a sales channel and you didn't have any stock you didn't have any inventory costs. Oh, absolutely. That's insane. Yeah. So, like people don't realize because when you get it wrong on inventory, you're stuck with that. Right. They never have that problem. So I mean being a distribution well, well, like circle back, how's that work then? Because if you're if if you were to be a wholesaler or a distributor on your own, you would be buying that product. You'd right. be buying that inventory. Right or you're having it drop sift and you've lost control of it. By not, when you buy it, if you bought wrong, you're stuck with that inventory. Right. And so if it didn't sell, you didn't know. Right. They, don't have, they don't own any of it. It's already here, but it got packaged here. It's gonna be going to the next place. If they could sell it directly while it was here, they just cut off the middleman. There you go. Right. That's how the industry will change then. That's, they're the only ones that can do it because they're the ones packaging it. Nobody else, I don't know of another, another it's company it's has that model. It's a very, very huge advantage to what we have going on from just cash flow. I mean, at the end wow. of the day, cannabis right now is a cash flow. You know, I think our fund should invest, you know, it'd be, be great to have equity in your company. <laughs> <laughs> we're always willing to take more. <laughs> All right, so we're here on phase three of this development. Okay. This is phase two, another, I think, about 17 buildings, and then phase one, which we were just at. Okay. Horse okay. not only can, can finance the acquisition and refinance in the build out of the buildings, but this entire phase three and all these 17 buildings, we financed the entire ground up build of all these buildings here. Every single one, this was all financed by us. Wow. This, this project was probably three, three months away from being fully, fully completed. The, the, um, the, the, the landscaping and the, the parking lot being completed and all these buildings being so you know. phase two consisted of how many facilities and phase three expands to what? I, I don't have all the numbers off the top of my head, but I would guess that they're all about 15 to 20 buildings each roughly okay 20 to 30,000 square, square feet roughly different there's mainly two different sizes gotcha um so what's again uh, important about this is that the entire cost of this facility are being amortized over the entire project all of these already have their conditional use permit you already know what you're buying all the infrastructure all the bandwidth all the services are in here you've got your co-packing and your packaging and your distributing right in here. you've got testing in here You've got multiple people. You've got the bandwidth of of, uh, of a knowledge base here that can support your business, right. as opposed to going out and building by yourself in somewhere remotely, where you're the only guy there. You don't have any infrastructure. You don't have anybody to service your air conditioning. You don't have anybody to figure out you've got dirty power that's that's cycling that on and off. You don't have that knowledge base to understand things to to move through something more quickly. It's a, the trial and error period is a lot longer, or you right. might not even ever be able to get anybody to come work out there. So, all of these specialty use properties require specialty, specialty type people to be running them, be, to build them, to operate them, to service them. Desert Hot Springs has, because they were one of the first, and this has been operating since 2016, this the city, you've got the depth of able to service all of this stuff and to build all this stuff. Right. Where right. You don't have that. You don't have that depth in humble. You wouldn't have that because they're not building these types of buildings. So every well, let's 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 walk over here just for a second. Come with me. Like show us real quick. Like a lot of these buildings here. When you talk about infrastructure, um, you're in the middle of uh, Desert Valley, 
hot desert area, but you're talking about the inside being 75 yeah, degrees. Yeah, so all these buildings are, are engineered. So any, any place that you build in the country, you're gonna ha it's never going to be perfect to have a controlled environment. You're, you're either going to have to heat it or cool it or somewhere in between some, certain parts of the year. So these buildings, even though we're out here in the desert and it gets up to you know triple digits here during the summertime, and, and, but it gets down to the 40s in the winter, which most people don't know either. It's a pretty big disparity. Right, okay. And so these buildings here are the, I don't remember what the technical uh, name of the insulation, but they're, the insulation on these buildings, regardless of what time of the day is without any air, air conditioning, is like 75, 80 degrees, which on a day when we're out here at 90 degrees, it feels air, air conditioned when you tran transition in there. So it's much easier to regulate that temperature. Yeah. Once you get the base regulated, now you're just modulating that base. You're not having to cool it and then recool it. And you know, it's it's just keeping, it's like your jacuzzi. Once you have it heated, you keep it heated. Yeah. And you just keep that, that yeah. slight temperature just to, and you try to keep it capped in, in the efficiency there. That's the case out here. And so why are you gonna go blow out all your money in a, uh, all your CapEx in your real estate where you can here you can buy it for much less expensive you have all the infrastructure you have the low opex cost here for for labor as right. well but just as importantly you have low tax base here for the excise tax so you have to look at all those variables combined now you do have a higher power cost here than you would in other markets but i mean how much power offset is it going to be before you have to offset the different the disparity of a of a higher uh, t purchase price and the labor cost that are never going to go away either so all these things you have to weigh, that's why Desert Hot Springs was a, a place that people said, hey, that works for me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go do it, I'm gonna go build my, 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 my project there. And you've got projects here from, from this is a large project because a, a, it's a complex, yeah. but these buildings are you know, 20, 30,000 square foot, maybe there's some 40,000 square foot, they're all two stories. But there's here in this whole, va in this whole region, You've got everything from 10,000 square foot facilities to 100,000 square foot facilities. There's ones that are contemplated here. Uh, Suniva, I think, is a million square foot. You know, I don't even know what the status of that of that is, but that's another story of why would you go blow out all your money on this massive facility? And now, just from this short time today, being with me and hearing some of our people, you realize that's too large of an area to control the microclimate in each room. Now, just to stop you for a sec. Rob, this is what we're in what what's called uh, a cannabis designation zone, right? Green so, zone, correct. The green zone. So these are all so you don't have other companies that are in here that are like making sweaters or anything like that. They're all related they, or mostly related to yeah, this. They, so they're they helping would never pay the premium to put for the purchase price for this. So no, it, it, they're they're not gonna they're not gonna be so here. this is an ecosystem where everybody's helping this each is, other. These right? are all cannabis related businesses, CRB. So every single thing in here whether they're a uh, ancillary and, and helping each other or competitors, there's still a knowledge base. There's still a community here. There's still a, an ability. If you befriend your neighbor, he might tell you something that might save you hundreds of thousands of dollars over time because they just figured it out their last facility and that's where they moved you. Or he might ship your product at 20% discount. So they're yeah, all helping right. each other. Well, 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 it might because he, it, but that actually might work because he might need some parking spaces even in here and he might have some room that, to move some of his, his uh, storage of something over to your side. So there's, there's those kind of deals that work out. But interestingly enough, this is a nuanced little sidebar, but in, in, the, in each of these facilities, each square foot is actually designated with each license. And mo these all hold multiple licenses. So cultivation has to be a designated room and you can't move that license within the room without reissuing the permit right. to where the, uh, just the, the uh, where the extraction is. So you don't have a, uh, once it's inside the building, you can't just mix and match. Right. You actually have to have those permits. So is this a model that you plan to expand across the country? Like, do you see this being a trend with some of the so, big multi-state operators? So I just want to shift the conversation to remind you that we're a lender. Yeah. So we look at all concepts across, all, all kinds of amazing concepts, whether it's a development like this, which works here, yep. but it might not work in some other regions of the country. Um, we're always looking at this and we're looking at the macro data that we have for the entire country and then into each individual state and in each, each individual re region to understand, does that person's model 
work because they don't have the data resources that we do. All right, so Desert Springs, uh, we've been through a lot of here today, a lot of the money that you've lended. You've made a big impact on the economy as well, but take us to where it all started, which is what we're focusing on here now, which is yeah. the Harborside Dispensary. Sure, so, so what, when Desert Hot Springs um, was the first municipality of the state of California to uh, go pro cannabis. And this transaction was the first loan that we did in Desert Hot Springs. And this particular transaction was just dirt, just similar to this dirt, if you wanna look over there for a second. Um, this, the borrower had purchased this raw land, entitled it and got it all spec for cannabis use, did all the plans for this, the architectural plans, and um, what we liked about this transaction, he had spent about 600,000 buying the property and doing all the soft costs for development, but nothing had been done yet. So it's free and clear. And so when we lent on this property, the original budget was about a million dollars to build this facility. What you can't really tell about this facility is this is actually mobile homes, or, or uh, this is modular trailers put together. And that's why it was so inexpensive to build. And you'll wow. only know it now that I've told you, if you walk through there, if you bounce, you can feel this, the, the thing bounce a little bit because it is, it is trailers. Um, and it was just a way to reduce cost. But the, some of the challenges that you had out here is the city of, of Desert Hot Springs is unincorporated. And so when the final building uh, permit was to be issued, the fire department kept dragging its feet to give the fire suppression. And ultimately you have to have the fire department's fire suppression for the, for the calcs to, to, to finish the, the project. And so the project was originally a 500 gallon uh, water suppression tank that you'll see uh, in the back, back here. And ultimately after a year of negotiating and going back and forth with the county, which was not cannabis friendly to get those issued, they came back and required them to have a 5,000 gallon tank, which blew the budget for the project. Why was that? Because the cost for the 500, 500 gallon tank might have been, I don't know, $50,000 and the 5,000 was a half million and it wasn't in the budget. So now we have to reassess the, the equity components and, and it needs to, the whole project needs to pencil. So, so a big political game in the, behind the scenes. Um, I, this one, I don't know, is, it's, I, it could be political, but it's just you have a disconnect. You have the county being not pro-cannabis um, and, the, and the city being one. And that's not uncommon in California. You can have a county that's pro and a city that's not or vice versa. Wow. And so on this particular project, you know, as, as, as a lender that's done thousands and thousands of transactions, we, we knew what was, what was the way to get it there if the borrower could, could, could do what we needed to do. So we, we did a blanket loan across this property and his, his owner occupied house on the Bayfront in San Diego, a multi-million dollar property. So we cross collateralized it. We told him, look, if you're gonna have to put the fire suppression for 5,000, you actually had four lots here. Why don't you go ahead and subdivide that and get all four of those lots uh, done? And then why don't you increase the size of the facility so that you have a, a bigger value basis for us to, to, to write that, to try to, to try to be able to fit that 5,000 gallon tank, water suppress, fire suppression tank into the budget. So we were able to help him balance that. We cross collateralized this house. We recast the loan, I think at 1.3 million or, or 1.75 or something. I, I don't remember what it was, but we were able to get it, get everything to pencil again. And then finally, we built the first, uh, this was gonna be the first drive-through in the country, but because of these delays, one other one beat us, beat these guys to it. But this is the only drive-through at the time, uh, as far as I know, it still is for, for California, which is, is, is interesting because we're right off here, off the, the freeway here, and you've got all the demand for all the Coachella and all these, these, these big events, mm -hmm. and everybody drives through and sees the harbor side dispensary here. So we, we built, provided the money to, to, to build the facility, once the, the transaction was built, um, this was eventually sold. Well, first they had Harborside was the tenant and it was a, an, an unaffiliated uh, owner of the building. So this was, a non, this was not an owner user, which is most common for us. But eventually Harborside um, bought this company and we were paid off many years ago. Wow. Now, when we did the um, state house roll up of the, of the merger, three way merger of Harborside Loud Pack and Urban Leaf, this was re one of the assets that we re-encumbered as part of that deal. So when they said, here, you know, do you want the information on that? We're like, we're good. We have everything on that property. So.
I'm Pedro Fonseca, I'm the Senior Director of Retail for State House. So basically, originally Harborside, then with the four-way merger, now Urban Leaf, Loud Pack, Sublime, Fuzzies. Um, opened this dispensary up, was it, you know, I was just looking at the pictures earlier, actually, 2019, we did the Coachella Valley meet and greet at the library, and then we opened it in November, but then did the grand opening December 7th of 2019. Does that seem like a long time ago now? It does. Yeah. I think back and I'm like, wait a minute. Okay, yeah. So 2019, and then we've been open ever since. Uh, the only dispensary, uh, drive through dispensary in Southern California. There's only one more that's in Northern California, but Shasta. Through 2020, they thought, oh, well, you know what? I'm just going to drive through. Right. They don't even realize we still have the inside. You know, so we'll see them. <laughs> to this day, they're like, oh, you have, an, you have, you have something inside? <laughs> that's yeah, pretty funny. Sure. So is this kind of like a landmark for concert goers that are going to Coachella? So it depends on the weather. Once again, like, I, for example, last, last Coachella, I was out there, and it would have been great except for the sandstorm. Yeah, and the sandstorm yeah, wow. gave you no visibility. That was the that was we had our investors out here. We couldn't even get from the bus to the to the door. It was so that gnarly. It was that bad. We couldn't so, even get so, the door open. Sandblasted. I'm curious how you've seen the form factors change from being primarily flower and probably still mainly flower. But what form factors are coming more into? Uh, and and it doesn't look like you have a whole lot of drinks, but uh, things are probably shifting around a little bit. So I would say like back in 2018, July 7th of 2018 there was, you know, we had got to the point where uh, we only had what, two, two strains of products because at that point it had to be child, you know, protective, ready to go. Yeah, customer yeah, ready, yeah, right? Yeah. So everything had to get pulled off the shelf that wasn't customer ready and we had to basically dispose of it. And the only thing I got left was like a handful of stuff. You know, fast forward to today, we've got, you know, sumo chips, we've got flour, we've got concerts, we've got drinks, you've got gummies. You know, you've got um, syrups, you have dip, you have right. an, an array of different things, right? But what's selling? Uh, the biggest thing is so funny because everybody's thinking like, oh, drinks is the new greatest, latest and greatest. Yeah, but I always attribute it to like craft beer. Yeah. Well, craft beer is craft beer. That's yeah. a lot. But the reality of it is, is that when you're sitting at the Super Bowl, you're not seeing craft beer on the commercials. Yeah. No. It's yeah. Coors and Budweiser. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, it, it's that same... Fact. We came across that analogy earlier today. It's so it's ironic. <laughs> yeah. So, so I asked that. Do we see that at a Super Bowl <laughs> ad? Eventually, we will. Yes. Eventually, we will. But I think the reality of it is, is timing is everything, right? Timing is everything, right? You know, kombucha when it first came on the market, right? It was the latest and greatest. It was vinegar, rotten vinegar, what have you? <laughs> you know, I ended up selling twelve thousand dollars a week of it. You know, on an end cap when I was with my, in my previous life. Uh, you know, and so it was <laughs> it's, really. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You know, and it was, you know, now it was one of the fastest growing categories there is in, in the grocery wow. industry. Wow. So, so it's one of these things where it'll come on. I think what happens is drinks is the fastest to market right now in a lot of ways. Yeah. yeah. It's the best, biggest form factor that's differentiating people. Because you have agua frescas, you've got lemonades, you've got sodas, you've got beer, you've got, you know, wine, you've got different form factors. But once again, certain categories, we should stick to what people know and what they're comfortable with. And I guess people are trying to say that that's that kind of like gateway you know because mm -hmm. it's a lower dose mm -hmm. but in reality it's just like one more thing to kind of great deter it from what they really need mm -hmm. and want because then they they may buy it once but they're not going to come back mm -hmm. so interesting it just it's, depends on what it is that's interesting um so uh how, how, right how, now, carts is our fr our fastest growing category. Which is, what is carts cartridges? Oh, okay, gotcha. It's outpacing flour huh. as a whole. It is. That's and interesting. It'll go back and forth every yeah. now. What's mm -hmm. the demo on that? Um, so usually, what's been happening? So I'll give an example. Just in Northern California, um, our demographic, like I said before, COVID was males between let's say fifty seven to seventy eight years old. Really? Kind of your baby boomers. There was your those are your huh. that was your bread and butter. Huh. Seriously. Oh, Jordan, interesting. Oh, it switched and it went to millennial males. Why do you think that age was age thirty five? Because a lot of people couldn't come out because the older generation right. was COVID. Yeah. Okay. They're gonna risk it. Yeah. So where are we where are we today? Today it's now uh, millennial males and females females spending buying 4.7 items compared to the males 3.8 items um and really? females are buying more through delivery and curbside than they are coming into the store that doesn't surprise me but, but the wow. difference that, is i'm surprised by that older. well the, the the delivery doesn't but, but the female but the, the, purchasing the, does but yeah. when i first started in 18 it was like two percent of the market 
Really? When I'm used to where I came and now from, it's like 50 in regular retail. So two percent of the market was female in, in like in our in our stores. Yeah. And that. now it's and now it's probably upwards of like say six, seven, eight, because they're coming on right. And so yeah. during COVID, they were at home, mm -hmm. the kids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're not going to smoke in front of people, but they're going to look at the difference. Is this though? The millennial male doesn't have as much expendable cash as the male that's you know, say older yeah. retired, right? right. So then immediately we went from maybe two or three eighths to maybe an eighth in some, some big cartridges. Mm. And then the female isn't going to buy the eighth of flour all the time. They're going to buy gummies. Well, then you right. have an average of $65 average ring of an eighth to now a $25 ring of, a, of an edible. Yeah. Right. So unfortunately, yes, it's great that we have more females coming onto the market, but the spend isn't always the same. Yeah. And they may be spending more for delivery, loading up, but they're going to come less time. Thank you, um, I was, you know, it's interesting to get perspective from from each of our our borrowers, and uh, you you sound like you've. I didn't realize that that you had the 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 the, the history of the facility as well. Yes, no, I, I uh, like I said, I started with Harborside in 2018. Uh, it was the first retailer they brought on, um, and Steve and Andrew were still here. And then first thing I was like, all right, you're gonna do San Leandro or Desert Hot Springs for us. Sure, all right. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. And if you like this video, wait until you see what we have next. Some of the best thought leaders in the verticals that we cover, from cannabis and psychedelics, to cryptos and NFTs and sports wagering. So if you wanna learn more, make sure to click on that bell for all notifications. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching.